Deception coming from a stranger hurts a lot, but what if it comes from someone you least expect? When Teresa Stone discovered her husband, Randy Stone's motionless body in their office on Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri, everyone's hearts went out to the grieving widow. It was clear that foul play had been involved, but was it an insurance deal gone wrong? Was it a jealous competitor? Was Randy at the wrong place at the wrong time? What seems cut and dry on the surface can be murky and deceitful underneath. This case, dubbed as the worst kept secret in New Hope Baptist Church history, is an ugly kaleidoscope of lies and secrets so unholy that even the walls of a confessional booth couldn't handle them. Randy Stone was born on June 14, 1967 in Kansas City, Missouri, where he spent all of his life. He was a devout Christian and religiously attended church with his family. Randy was defined as a tough guy with a heart of gold. He was also very competitive, fond of fitness and sports took almost all of his free time. Right down the street from the Stone family was the Grinwald family. And one day while playing on these very streets, Randy met a girl named Teresa Greenwald. Teresa was also born in Kansas on December 6, 1971, making Randy about four years older. Teresa and Randy quickly became high school sweethearts, though Teresa wanted to take the relationship to the next level, but Randy had other plans as he was enlisted in the Marines and left for four years serving during Desert Storm and then moving on to the Army Reserves. After he came back to Kansas, Randy and Teresa reconnected, and shortly after they started officially dating. Teresa was enamored by Randy. He loved her outgoing personality and quirky sense of humor. Teresa was no stranger to the Stone family either because they practically lived within walking distance and she was considered family. They all loved that Randy and Teresa were in a happy relationship. In 1990, less than one year after dating, Randy and Teresa got married and settled down in Kansas permanently. In 1991, they welcomed a son, Michael, and then a daughter, Miranda, two years later. Not long after, Randy opened his branch of the Farmers Insurance Agency on Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri. His competitiveness really accelerated the business, and it was one of the most successful agencies in the region. Teresa also helped out Randy at the insurance office, first as a customer service representative, and then later as a licensed agent. Even with all the meetings, the trips, and managing a thriving business, Randy and Teresa's relationship was still the same. They were affectionate towards each other, weren't afraid of showing their love, and Randy even wrote poetry for his wife. Randy was a truly family man, and his priority was always his wife and kids. If you thought that work took up most of the Stones family's lives, you would have been mistaken, because the second place people would find them was at their community church, New Hope Baptist. Randy, being great with numbers and an overall helpful person, was the church's minister of records, part of the finance committee, and even drove the Sunday bus. Teresa, on the other hand, helped out in the kitchen, sang in the choir, and organized various events. So from the looks of it, Randy and Teresa had a very fulfilling life. The couple were madly in love with each other. They had the perfect family dynamic, they ran a successful business together, and they had a loving church community. But misery had soon found its way into the Stone family. And in 2010, things came crashing down and everything changed for the worse. March 31st, 2010 was just another normal day for 39-year-old Teresa. She spent the afternoon with her daughter running errands before dropping by Randy's office to finish her workday. But as soon as she pulled into the parking lot, right next to Randy's car, she immediately knew something was off. The blinds on the windows were shut, and alarmingly the front door was locked, which wouldn't be the case if everyone in the office were still on the clock, as they should have been. Teresa proceeded to unlock the door with her keys and stepped into the office, which was dark and silent. Nothing looked out of place, though, as Randy's computer was still on, but he was nowhere to be found. She then went into her office, and what she saw was nothing short of terrifying. 43-year-old Randy was lying on the floor, completely lifeless. Teresa, on impulse and in obvious panic, grabbed the office phone and called her parents. She told them that Randy had been shot and that he'd passed away. Her parents instructed her to call 911 immediately, which she did. Surprisingly, though, Teresa didn't tell the operator that Randy had been shot. She just continuously stated that something had happened to her husband, 
He was emotionless and that she didn't know what to do. A team of officers arrived on Noland Road, and when they checked on Randy, he had unfortunately passed away. There was one single shell casing on the floor next to Randy, which belonged to a 40 caliber firearm. Police concluded that Randy had been hit in the head at close range with that firearm. Officers initially thought that Randy passed away in a robbery gone wrong, but that theory was soon ruled out when they saw money, $150 to be exact, lying undisturbed on the office table. Randy's wallet was also still in his back pocket. On top of that, there weren't any signs of forced entry. So officers immediately thought that Randy was probably attacked by someone he knew, and they wanted to investigate this case in light of a possible homicide. But there is one more thing the police discovered, which turned the case on its head. In the trash can, right next to Randy's body, was a torn up letter that officers immediately took in as evidence. The letter turned out to be an unsigned love letter written by someone for Teresa. And no, the writer wasn't Randy, as a forensic handwriting analysis was done on the letter, and even a side-by-side -side comparison, the letter's writing looked completely different from Randy's. What was even more bizarre were the contents of the letter itself, which read something like this. Happy birthday, love. You're so very precious to my heart. You possess the most tender spot in my heart. I care for you more than anyone else on earth, and I desire to be with you every moment of every day. Your birthday is my favorite day. I remember nine years ago telling you that I had something for you in my office. It was me. I wanted to give you me. That kiss you took, and then you gave me one back. I felt like it was my birthday. I'm not in control of things yet, but when we're fully together, your birthday will always be exciting. From the looks of it, it seemed like Teresa's mysterious admirer knew her, and they most certainly had been intimate with each other, and on top of that, it was nine years ago. But hold on to your seats, because this piece of paper would unveil some secrets you never even imagined. The news of Randy's tragic passing quickly spread throughout the city. His family was struck with unimaginable grief and shock. Meanwhile, Teresa was taken to the station for a statement so that the police could get more information on who would actually want to hurt Randy, a person who was honorable and well-loved in the community and had no enemies. Teresa gave Detective Keith Rosewarn a detailed rundown on what had happened earlier that day. She was very forthcoming, precise with her explanation, and had an airtight alibi. Interestingly, she remained calm and collected, and even though her voice sounded quivery, there weren't any tears in her eyes. Now, a lot of people thought that this was her way of grieving. Some people just never shed a tear until days, weeks, or even months after the fact. Still, it was weird how she acted throughout the investigation, considering her loving, loyal, and caring husband of 20 years had tragically and suddenly passed away. Detective Rose Warren thought that Teresa was acting suspiciously, especially when he asked about the firearm used on Randy. The police actually found out that Randy had also owned a 40 caliber handgun, but Teresa claimed that he'd sold the gun a while ago, but she didn't know who he sold it to. Teresa was also questioned about the letter. She initially feigned confusion, but as she was left alone for a moment in the interrogation room, which mind you had hidden cameras and voice recording devices, she was seen muttering, oh great, I forgot about that. When the questioning continued, Teresa said that the letter was actually from a secret admirer, and that it was left on her car door several years back. To add to the oddness, Teresa said that she had just found the letter a few days back, tucked away in her wallet, and she trashed it. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone gets an anonymous love letter, they'd probably trash it right away, especially considering Teresa was married with children. So why would Teresa keep a letter like that? Regardless, Teresa was allowed to go home after the interview because even though Detective Rose Warren was suspicious of her, he needed more proof. Now, you would think that Teresa was absolutely broken over the tragic passing of her husband, but her actions were more skeptical than anything. Just a day after Randy's unfortunate passing, Teresa was digging into Randy's file cabinets and asking his friend, Robert Davis, about how much money she was going to get from Randy's two life insurance policies that he took out. To say that Robert was taken aback by Teresa's lack of emotion and apparent hunger for money was an understatement. Fast forward to April 6th of 2010, just a short while later, and Randy's funeral was held in the New Hope Baptist Church. The church was overflowing with people since Randy was a very respectable man in the community, and they were there to pay their respects and support Randy's family during this painful time. 
Randy's eulogy was delivered by the pastor, David Love, who had known him for years and was also one of his best friends at church. So overall, it was a very sad day. The police, though, were also at the funeral in hopes of finding a lead on Randy's case. They questioned a lot of people, and on April 20th, Teresa was called in again for questioning. And this time, detectives charged straight ahead and pressed that Randy's passing was premeditated. Detective Rose Warren even asked about the call Teresa made to her parents and 911 and the difference in her statements at that time, which was extremely strange. Here's the thing, no one could have known that Randy was shot, especially at first glance, but Teresa knew, which was highly suspicious. After all, Teresa claims to have just walked into the office and spotted Randy lying on the ground. So if she didn't get a close examination of his body and didn't remove any of his clothing to check for what sort of wound he had, then how could she have known how he had lost his life? Finally, Teresa caved under the intense pressure and confessed that she knew Randy was shot because she got a suspicious text from someone. When asked about the sender of the text, Teresa gave the most unexpected answer. It was from pastor David Love. But Teresa wasn't done talking. She also admitted to something else, and it was far more dreadful. Turns out, Teresa had been involved in a 10-year-long affair with Pastor David Love. The jig was up. Teresa, the seemingly perfect and affectionate wife to Randy, was cheating on her husband for over a decade. Their whole marriage had been one big lie. And if that wasn't disgusting enough, she was getting cozy with the man who was Randy's best friend, the man who gave a eulogy at Randy's funeral, and the man who gave the couple spiritual advice every Sunday. It's so hard to wrap your head around this, but things just get uglier from this point on. So David Love was born in the Midwest in 1960, and his parents were missionaries. Basically, his whole family was dedicated to the church and its cause from the very beginning. Years ago, David had attended a Baptist college in the South, where he met Kim Turner, and the couple got married on June 26, 1982, and they started a family. David went on to become a youth minister and a pastor at a couple of churches before joining the New Hope Baptist Church in 1999. David instantly became well-known in the New Hope Baptist Church because he was young, attractive, and extremely charismatic. His preaching style was also mesmerizing. It was something that Randy was also extremely fond of. Randy admired David and looked up to him for guidance. David was also very friendly with women, and this was something that Kim, his wife, was used to and tolerated well. But Kim and other members of the church soon noticed that another woman and David were getting a little too close. And that woman was Randy's wife, Teresa Stone. It started with slight physical touches, and church members chalked this behavior up to a very close faith-based relationship between a pastor and a member of the church. But things soon caught fire, and Teresa was seen going in and out of David's office alone for a few days each week for counseling sessions. Granted, David did have these sessions with other members of the church, and even Randy was counseled by David once a week. But Teresa's so-called sessions became more frequent, almost a couple times a day. And within a year, Teresa and David were stepping out on each other's spouses. It's speculated, according to that recovered love letter, that David initiated the affair, but Teresa did ultimately reciprocate. They communicated via burner phones so that their respective spouses wouldn't know. The affair was very emotionally charged and intimate, with pictures and emails being sent for 10 years. It wasn't just a fling or a rush of excitement either. Teresa and David were very much in love, and as the years went by, they even wanted to get married. They were pretty much planning their wedding on texts and emails, and David had even bought Teresa an engagement ring. This was not your ordinary affair. This was something next level. Kim started to notice that David was hiding something from her, and she even discovered the burner phone and the intimate messages between him and Teresa. But for unexplained reasons, she decided to stay with David, knowing that he was two-timing her. As for Randy, on the outside, it looked like he had no clue about his wife's infidelity. But something did happen to raise suspicions in his mind. In 2004, Teresa got pregnant. But here's the kicker. Randy had a vasectomy done years prior, so they technically couldn't conceive. Now, vasectomies aren't 100% effective, and some couples do conceive after the procedure. But as it would turn out, the unborn baby's father was, in fact, Pastor David, and not Randy. Randy thought that this unborn child was a gift from God, and he was more than thrilled about the baby's arrival. 
So could you imagine the betrayal this poor man would have gone through if he found out the truth? He was ready to father a child that wasn't even his, regardless of if he knew it or not. Sadly, though, the baby didn't make it. Teresa unfortunately miscarried early on. Another weird event was when Teresa encouraged Randy to take counseling sessions with David because she caught him watching indecent adult videos. And that's pretty rich coming from someone who's behind her husband's back and getting intimate with the pastor, Randy's best friend for 10 years. David, in these heart-to-heart -heart counseling sessions with Randy, taught him how to be a better father and a husband. What's so sad is that Randy wanted to be a better husband for Teresa. He wanted her to see him as the perfect partner, and he was willing to go to any lengths to make Teresa happy. It's just so heartbreaking to see that Randy was backstabbed and betrayed by two of the closest people in his life. This is just so over the top that it borders on unbelievable. So how did all this escalate from keeping a decades-long affair under wraps to the very unfortunate passing of Randy? Well, there's something that happened that drove Teresa and David into a corner and they felt that they had no choice but to remove Randy from the picture for good. See, on March 16th, 2010, just two weeks before Randy met his fateful end, he found some inconsistencies in the church finances. Turns out that David was taking out checks from the church for himself. David had a habit of stealing money from the church, and previously he had not accounted for $30,000 that had suspiciously gone missing at the Independence Ministry. He most likely pocketed the money that was supposed to be a fund for missionary salaries. I swear this man is just the gift that just keeps on giving. Anyway, Randy confronted David a day after the discovery and wrote an email saying that he was resigning from the Sunday school teaching program and the Minister of Records position, stating that he and his family wouldn't get involved in this scandal and would soon after leave the church. Now, this was a double blow for David. Firstly, he knew well that Randy had dirt on him and that this could ruin his reputation and independence because no one wanted a money-stealing, backstabbing, marriage-wrecking pastor to preach about God and being good. Secondly, Randy leaving the church meant that David could no longer get to see Teresa, which would obviously end their relationship. There was a motive for David as far as the eye can see, but there were other obstacles besides Randy. In order for David to start his new life with Teresa, he also had to deal with his wife, Kim. Shockingly, David had plotted to drive Kim and her car off a cliff, making it look like a freak accident. The original plan was to deal with Kim first, but since Randy was being difficult and adamant about leaving the church, David knew that Randy had to be silenced first. But what about Teresa? Did she really want to leave her loving husband of 20 years for a 10-year behind-closed-doors affair? Well, the answer was sadly yes. Aside from being apart from her lover, Teresa had her eyes on the bigger prize, the $800,000 insurance payout that she would get if Randy passed away. David and Teresa wanted to use this money to start their new life together, which again is just so unbelievably cold, I, 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 just, I just can't. But regardless, a plan was concocted. David decided to attack Randy in his insurance office. Teresa helped David by giving him the house garage code and even the code to Randy's gun safe, where David chose the weapon, Randy's own 40 caliber handgun. These two weren't just satisfied with doing the dirty work, they also decided to use Randy's own weapon against him. In the afternoon of March 31st, 2010, it's assumed that David went into Randy's office while Teresa was out, hence her solid alibi, and David took Randy's life with a single round. After that, he closed the blinds, locked the door on his way out, and just left. David also got rid of the weapon at some point, but the police have never recovered it. David also texted Teresa, advising her not to go to the office alone, which was a clear indicator that Teresa knew that Randy had passed away. But according to what happened, she did end up going and discovering her husband, who her lover had savagely attacked. But the story still isn't over yet. Teresa had now revealed the affair to Detective Rose Warren, but there's more. She confessed to destroying the burner phone on the day of Randy's passing. Detective Rose Warren wanted to get a confession from David so that he could get substantial evidence to arrest him, and he advised Teresa to call him from the interrogation room, which she willingly did. Still, David didn't say anything, even after getting coerced by Teresa. That same day, David was brought in for questioning, and he stated that he was not in town at the time of Randy's attack. 
Since the evidence was circumstantial, Detective Rose Warren couldn't arrest David, and unfortunately he was free to go. But what he did next was truly appalling. David went home and confessed to his wife and kids about the affair, and wrote a cryptic letter of resignation to the New Hope Baptist Church that stated that he'd sinned and that he was sorry for letting everyone down. But that's not the alarming part. It was the fact that after a couple of days, he left Kansas with his passport and birth certificate and moved to North Carolina to work as a truck driver, of all things. But the police were on to him as they hit another jackpot that invalidated David's alibi. See, David's cell phone records showed that he was in the area where Randy's office was at the time of the crime. He shouldn't have been there unless he had villainous intentions, which he obviously did. With all of the evidence in Teresa's statement, David Love was finally arrested on November 9th of 2010, about eight months after the crime had taken place. He was brought back from North Carolina to Missouri to face first-degree charges for the fatal attack on Randy. A deposition was held for David's trial, and the star witness was Teresa. But in a manner of speaking, Teresa was about to put her foot in her own mouth and only made a bad situation even worse. At trial, Teresa revealed that on March 16, 2010, the same day when Randy found out about the stolen church funds, Teresa had texted David saying that she wanted Randy gone. It was speculated that Teresa didn't want to leave the church and ultimately David when Randy said that he wanted to resign and distance himself from the whole issue. Add to that the fact that she gave David the codes to their garage and Randy's safe, it's easy to see that Teresa had a part in her husband's tragic passing, which only adds fuel to the fire. In the end, Teresa was charged as well. As for David, his lawyers asked for a plea deal on the condition of reducing the charges to second degree, to which the prosecution surprisingly agreed. David pleaded guilty, and he was given life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. He's currently serving his sentence in the Southeast Correctional Center in Charleston, Missouri, and will be eligible for parole in 2036. Even after being sentenced, David refused to come out with a confession on what happened on the day of Randy's passing. So we really don't know the full extent of Teresa's involvement in Randy's attack. As a result, Teresa was also offered a plea deal for a maximum sentence of 10 years. At the sentencing, Randy and Teresa's neighbors, notably Shelley Bell and other church members, were in favor of the maximum sentence. Meanwhile, Teresa and children Michael and Miranda begged the judge for leniency. At 20 and 18 years of age, Michael and Miranda had already lost their father thanks to their mother's raging desires, and now they had to go through the pain of losing their entire family. They were fully aware of their mother's actions, but you can, to some extent, understand their plea for leniency. Ultimately, Teresa was sentenced to eight years, which is next to nothing considering how she destroyed a family for a vile man and his attention. As for Kim, she divorced David shortly after the sentencing, remarried and moved on with her life, putting the whole thing behind her. As of 2022, Teresa was released from prison and is now living her life in Kansas, Missouri with another man. But still, the story isn't quite over. Remember the $800,000 Teresa thought she was going to get? Well, this is a plot twist that even Teresa didn't expect. Turns out, Randy had changed the life insurance beneficiaries in 2004 after Teresa's pregnancy announcement. Now, the money would go to children Michael and Miranda, who were minors at the time of the change, and not Teresa. This fact leads many people to believe that Randy knew more about Teresa's little rendezvous than he was letting on. Regardless, the look on Teresa's face had to have been priceless when she found out. Randy's mother, Clara, knew loss all too well. She lost her husband, Leonard, in 1993, but she still had her son by her side. Clara was extremely proud of David and all of his accomplishments. She was an advocate for forgiveness, firmly believing that her son didn't deserve to lose his life. She says that if her daughter-in-law was unhappy, she should have just filed for divorce, even though it's frowned upon in their faith. Clara lamented that at least her son and the father of their children would still be alive, and I agree wholeheartedly. I, too, don't believe divorce should ever be on the table except for rare circumstances that most of us will never experience. Considering this is a religious-oriented case, you can take a quick look at scripture and see that we're only ever given one single justification for divorce, adultery. This is mentioned in Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19.9. Now, you could also make a case for abandonment as well based on 1 Corinthians 7.15, but that justification is less clear. 
With this in mind, both David and Teresa were already breaking the number one rule of marriage. Don't cheat on your spouse. So with that in mind, why not go ahead and break another rule and just get divorced? After all, no single sin is greater than another. We know this from James 2.10. So they may as well have just gotten divorced and moved on. They clearly weren't concerned with practicing what they preached anyway. I just can't seem to understand why Teresa and David chose to end David's life other than the obvious motive of getting the life insurance payout after his passing. But from the way I understand the story, the life insurance payout was more of an afterthought than anything. This case is the epitome of betrayal. To think that Randy, a loving member of the community, was seen as nothing more than a problem for his wife and supposed best friend is mind-boggling. In the end, this case just leaves everyone devastated. These two supposedly Christian individuals broke two of the most obvious rules in Christianity. Don't betray your spouse and don't take someone else's life. Even if you dislike someone, Christians are commanded, not suggested, but commanded to love that person anyway, in Luke 6, 27, just as you would love yourself or your neighbor, especially if that person is your own spouse. But for both Teresa and David, they chose to ignore these commandments and just do whatever they wanted to do. And unfortunately, David paid the ultimate price for sins that weren't even his own. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you like this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.